We are very excited to host today's event. It's an important and critical topic, and we are honored to be joined by this esteemed panel, which includes one of our advisory board members, Sarah Kate Ellis. You'll hear more about these phenomenal change makers shortly, but first I'd like to introduce you to my fabulous colleague, Dr. Sylvia Meyer, who serves as academic director and clinical associate professor here at the CGA and leads the concentration in global gender studies within our graduate program. Sylvia, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you, Bianca. Um, a warm welcome uh, from me and all of us here at the Center for Global Affairs uh, to this very, very, very important conversation that we will be having over the next hour. Uh, today, we're talking about a most timely topic, how philanthropy can advance LGBTQIA plus equality. As we know, those of us who are interested in politics and are attuned uh, to current events, anti-LGBTQIA plus measures are being introduced as we speak in state legislatures across the country and around the world at alarming rates. Communities, activists, politicians, and nonprofits are working tirelessly to ensure that our community, especially those most vulnerable, have their rights protected, access to services ensured, and dignity enshrined. Donors of all kinds, individuals, foundations, and companies want to be part of solutions. And today's panel will thus explore what role can we each play? How can we drive change? And what might we need to approach differently, especially as politics and the discourse is moving very, very fast? In consideration of the nonprofit leaders and fundraisers in our audience, we'll also touch on how you can engage a diverse and dynamic base of philanthropists in your work in this area. To begin, it's now my real great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel. Sarah Kate Ellis joined GLAD as the president and CEO in 2014 after a successful career as a media executive. She has refocused the organization's advocacy to focus on accelerating acceptance of the LGBTQ community through initiatives, campaigns, and programs. Under her leadership, she has evolved GLAD from a media watchdog organization to one of the most powerful cultural change agents across industries. She also currently serves on the board of our Center for Global Affairs. Uh, Sarah Kate, it's a pleasure to have you on this panel. Next um, is Rebecca Fox. Uh, Rebecca is the Vice President of Programs at Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice. She's a longtime supporter of grassroots feminist LGBTQI movements. She previously served as the Senior Program Officer at the SOGI team at Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, where she coordinated grant making on a variety of issues related to the rights of and improving the lived experiences of LGBTI people. She was formerly the executive director of the National Coalition for LGBT Health and an adjunct professor of human sexuality at George Washington University. It's great to have you, Rebecca. Chris Hayashi is the executive director at Transgender Law Center, one of the largest organizations in the country advancing the rights of transgender and gender non-conforming people in 2015. As a public transgender person of color, Chris has been a leader in movements for justice and rights for transgender and gender non-conforming communities for over 13 years. Chris previously served in leadership roles at organizations such as Youth United for Community Action in California and the Audrey Lord Project. And last but definitely not least, Katie Hultquist. Katie is the Director of Leadership Giving at Outright Action International. With a career in the nonprofit sector spanning more than 20 years, she brings a deep understanding of nonprofit management and fundraising to her work. Prior to her current role, Katie served as the Northwest Regional Director of Nuestros Pequeños Hermanos USA, where she led efforts to support programs for vulnerable children in Latin America and the Caribbean. She also spent nine years as the executive director of Passage Northwest in Seattle, working to build courage and leadership in girls through the outdoors and the arts. Um, dear audience, as you can see, we have an absolutely stellar, as we say in German, a high carrot panel, and I can't wait to get our conversation started. 
let's get started with um, a quick general um, sense of where we are. Question for all, Chris, Sarah, Kate, uh, Rebecca, and Katie. Chris, maybe uh, we can start with you. Um, can you share with us a little about your lens on the conversation we'll be having today? Tell us about your vision for LGBTQIA plus equality. What are you working towards? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, so yeah, so I'm based at the Transgender Law Center. We're the largest national transit organization in the country. So I definitely see this conversation and my kind of lens and vision is very much rooted in the work of trans movements and communities, um, particularly in the US, but you know, uh, it's a global movement as well. And I would say centering communities within the trans community who really have faced some of the greatest barriers to survival and some of the highest levels of attack, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color, migrants, people living with HIV, people living with disabilities, youth, elders, and particularly Black trans women and femmes, who both have faced some of the greatest challenges and I would say are leading some of the most innovative, powerful, and beautiful ones. So that's a little bit about the, the lens I uh, take. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing. Uh, Sarah, Kate, uh, what are you working right on right now? <laughs> um, well, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. I think um, when we think about, um, especially what's happening here in the United States um, and the attacks and the backlash that we're seeing for the LGBTQ community um, at record rates than we've ever seen them before. I think in the seat that I sit in, which is about cultural change, um, it's really important to look at that. I think what we're seeing right now is a bit of a double-edged sword as we're seeing visibility of our community rise, especially um, folks in our community who haven't in the past been visible. Um, we're seeing more legislation against them and we're seeing more violence um, against them. And so for me, holistically, it's about educating, holding back, helping people unravel their fear. And then it's about pushing back and using the levers of power to push back on especially the legislation. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Sarah Kate. Hugely important foci. Um, Rebecca, on to you. Please tell us a little bit more about what you're working towards. Sure. So, Estrella is a global organization, and we make grants in the US, but literally all around the world. Um, and I would say Estrella is an LBQ feminist grant maker, which is a little bit different of a take. Um, most of our organizations that we support are based in the global south or east and in the United States and the uh, in the southeast as well. And our grantees are really working um, for a liberation agenda. So an agenda that moves us beyond and truly all of us, not just queer, trans and intersex people, to a space of openness where people are able to live their lives fully without fear of the violence that Sarah Kate was talking about with um, acceptance by the state as needed and an ability to love and build the lives that they want to without fear of violence or rejection. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing. Um, so the red thread that we're already seeing develop in the work of the organizations is centering the needs of the particularly vulnerable communities, working towards cultural change and working towards a real and the implementation of a true and genuine liberation agenda. Um, and last but not least, Katie, please, uh, will you tell us a little bit more what you're working towards? Of course. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Sylvia. Bianca and Michelle for inviting me and outright to join you. It's a huge honor to be on this panel with our friends and colleagues from so many wonderful organizations that we have partnered with and respect and admire. Um, and I always love talking about philanthropy and speaking to fundraising professionals. So welcome everybody. Um, for those who don't know us, Outright's mission is to protect and advance human rights for LGBTIQ people around the world. And we are headquartered in New York and have staff in 12 countries. And the vision that we're working for is really to protect and uplift the most at-risk queer people by really radically accelerating legal and social change around the world. And we are not um, 
you know, Pollyanna about the threats that we're facing, but I think we're also optimistic that there's a lot of uh, opportunity for progress. So we're really pursuing that vision with a few main strategies. We're really committed to helping queer grassroots groups and activists in underfunded regions and countries. And we have done research that has shown that all, there are almost 30 countries, probably a, a little bit less now, but um, as of a couple of years ago, there are almost 30 countries that have absolutely no LGBTIQ organizations, which really obviously leaves our community vulnerable and without support systems. Um, so we're focusing on helping those groups and activists. We're supporting the creation of laws and policies that are aimed at protecting and advancing equality for our community, especially in places where we see that landmark change as possible or needed. And then finally, working with our local partners, we are continuing to provide humanitarian response and relief efforts. Um, and we've particularly focused on that with uh, COVID and also the war in Ukraine, but are going to be continuing to do that work in the future as well. And I guess I just wanted to end by saying, and I know um, I share this, these beliefs with my other colleagues that our vision is really <clears throat> grounded in a few key values and principles. One is that we really believe that change has to come from and be led at the local level and local and national level within countries and regions. And so we are very committed to transferring power and sharing power and um, the voices of frontline activists. Um, the second thing is a commitment to intersectionality in our understanding of how queer people experience the world based on our the diverse aspects of our identities and also that our movement must work. As Rebecca said, we have to look beyond our movement and work in solidarity with other movements for gender equality, racial justice, climate justice, et cetera. And then the final thing is just to emph emphasize as part of that, that Outright has always been and will always be a feminist organization and that that feminism is both unapologetic and inclusive of trans, non-binary and gender non-conforming people, period. So um, it's, that, those are the things that are on my mind and part of our vision right now. Fabulous, thank you so much, Katie. Um, again, stressing the importance of grassroots empowerment and grassroots work, um, the absolute imperative of including and using an intersectional lens and intersectional approach uh, to bringing about sustainable change, uh, solidarity, um, absolutely 100% and inclusivity, 100%. Um, thank you so much. Um, panelists for this for these uh, brief um, overviews of your vision for um, uh, for your organizations. Let's now uh, take again a big picture view uh, for the next round of, of questions and before we go into the conversation about you know where philanthropy comes in. A question for Sarah Kate. Um, how would you describe when you know when you, you watch television, when you watch the news, uh, when you kind of absorb what's going on in the world, how would you describe our current moment and where do you see all of us uh, in the fight for LGBTQIA plus equality? Sarah, Kate, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think our our current moment is is a bit confusing, honestly. Um, we've never seen more representation in television and streaming content, more diverse representation. For the past few years, we've seen more people of color, LGBTQ characters than white characters. So we're seeing great advancements. We've never seen more trans representation, some of it good, some of it not so good, um, but, and gender non-binary representation. And so we're we're starting to see more and more representation and diverse representation. We're seeing a lot less of um, LGBTQ people dying as part of the plot and storylines. So we're we're seeing great movements there. We're also seeing like you juxtapose that to the news that we're seeing which is this past legislative session, over 300 anti-LGBTQ bills at the state and local level. So we're talking about the local level and then we're talking about the national level and what we're seeing on screens. And so, and we're seeing more um, young folks come out as LGBTQ than we've ever seen before. Um, which is amazing and means that there is a path forward. It is, but we've also never seen such 
a strong backlash either. So I think that when we look at our culture at this given moment, it truly is a mixed bag. We see corporate standing up for LGBTQ people, but maybe not all the way. And we need to push them further on that. Um, we see philanthropists um, and I know we'll get further into this, who have traditionally been in the LGBTQ space pulling money. Um, and we see others stepping in like corporates, but then there's an agenda type tied to that, right? So I think it's a really interesting time. And I don't think that there is a one, one answer to that question that it is mixed at this moment. Thank you so much for sharing uh, this, Sarah Kate. Um, maybe one way of 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 looking at it is it's it's progress, but the progress is fragile. It's fragile and reversible, as we have you know, as we're witnessing right now around the world and the number, or even in this country, I should say, right now. Um, I think you mentioned the number of three hundred um, anti-LGBTQI bills uh, that are being introduced uh, in legislatures uh, in the various states. You know, these are just numbers that uh, you know make our hair stand on end. Um, uh, from the domestic now to the, so thank you Sarah Kate again uh, from the domestic now to the international uh, Katie could I turn to you please um, since your organization works internationally um, how would you describe uh, the picture globally Sarah Kate already got us started a little bit on this but could, if you could expand on this a little bit more that would be great thank you sure thank you Sylvia <clears throat> well it's very difficult to cover the whole globe but let me try to give a broad overview and and um, Rebecca may also want to chime in as well uh, but the truth is that while there is no country that has achieved full equality, and we see the backlash happening here in the US and across the globe, there are huge disparities around the world in terms of progress and the threats that our communities are facing. So just to give a couple of examples of that, there are still 67 countries that have laws criminalizing same-sex relations. 11 of those impose a death penalty. There are about 50 countries that criminalize transgender people, either explicitly or implicitly. There are about 14 countries that explicitly ban so-called conversion therapy, traumatic and abusive practices to try to force people to change their sexual orientation and gender identity. Only 14 countries ban those practices. Um, we see a well-coordinated and funded backlash, as Sarah mentioned, against women's rights, LGBTIQ rights. These are aligned, um, as you know, Rebecca has, we've talked about before, absolutely aligned with anti-democracy efforts that are happening around the world and here in our country. Um, and we see violence rising and repression or anti-LGBTIQ laws being proposed in places from Indonesia to Hungary, to Russia, to Ghana, Zambia, and many more. Um, and there's also a lot of places where even having a gathering like this could be cause for censorship arrest or arrest. But the good news is that, of course, despite these challenges, we have seen in the last couple decades, a huge amount of progress. There are at least 15 countries that have decriminalized homosexuality in the last 10 years, there are 30 countries that have codified marriage equality at the national level. And I think uh, more than half of those have happened in the last five years alone. Um, 2019, the World Health Organization removed being transgender from its classification of mental illnesses. And we do see, even though I mentioned, you know, there's about 30 countries where we, we do not find any LGBTIQ organizations, um, still there's a vibrant and a burgeoning network of activists and local groups that are pressing for change nearly everywhere in the world. And, and that number is growing every single year. So I think the bottom line is that, yes, the progress has been fragile and we need to be vigilant, but we also see a huge opportunity to radically accelerate social and legal change. And that is really what motivates outright and me personally to keep doing this work every day um, because there's such an opportunity um, and momentum that we can build on to keep pushing forward. Thank you so much, Katie, um, both for uh, providing, you know, some numbers, uh, you know, where we are legally right now around the world. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, 67 countries um, in the world out of about 200, that's that's a lot. This is, you know, about uh, one third uh, still criminalizes. Um, 
uh, same-sex marriage, uh, same-sex relations, uh, 11 impose the death penalty for homosexuality or for same-sex sexual relations. I mean, these are numbers that are absolutely horrifying. And uh, you end on a, on a somewhat, uh, in your remarks, on a somewhat positive note, you know, that change is happening, change is possible. And uh, in a few minutes, we will be talking about, you know, how, you know, philanthropists, you know, can accelerate this change and how we can uh, bring about change collectively. Um, so thank you for that, Katie. Um, I would now like to uh, turn to Chris. Uh, we have been speaking about LGBTQIA rights globally uh, from a more general perspective. And Chris, um, could you speak a little bit more about what trans movements are experiencing right now? Please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll say to preface it, I'm, I'm more speaking within a, a, US, <clears throat> a US context. Um, so I think what's important to say first is that for trans communities, the reality is that we've been facing ongoing violence, harassment, discrimination, and overall lack of having our basic needs met. And that this is particularly true for black and brown trans people, that this has been true for some time and continues today. But what we've seen over the last, I would say decade or so, is that the conservative right, the far right, has really taken on attacking trans communities from the kind of early days in 2015 or so of the bathroom bills, um, most kind of known is the bill in North Carolina um, to the Trump administration, where basically he did everything he possibly could to roll back the few rights and protections that trans people have to, and ultimately to deny our very existence and our humanity. To what we've seen over the last two years, while we're under a more friendly federal administration, the attacks have clearly moved back to the state level. We've seen an escalation in anti-trans legislative and policy attacks. Um, as other folks have raised up. And alongside that, we've also seen an escalation in violence and harassment. Every year for the last few years, we've seen the most reported murders of black trans women and femmes in the US. And I wanna talk specifically about what the last couple months have been like, because while we've been in an ongoing period of anti-trans attacks, legislative policy, narrative, cultural um, and societal, the, the last couple of months we've seen an absolute escalation. And so this really came to the forefront with Texas. And I'm gonna take a little bit of time here. So the Texas Attorney General backed by the governor in March or February of this year declared providing gender affirming care to transgender children and youth is child abuse. So within a matter of days, we started to hear from local partners that trans families who love and support their transgender children were starting to be investigated by Child Protective Services in Texas. So this was, of course, absolutely terrifying to families, to transgender children, to young people, to transgender people generally, and was an absolute escalation in the types of attacks our communities have been facing from the conservative right. Soon after that, Alabama passed one of the worst trans healthcare bans we've seen basically making it a felony to provide gender affirming care to a transgender minor, punishable with up to 10 years in prison. So we saw, seen in the last couple of months, a, a real escalation in the attacks by, from the conservative right and the far right on trans communities. And what we also know is that while I'm talking about the policies that were put in place, the bills that were passed, as folks have spoken about, there were hundreds of bills across the country. And the reality is that even when those bills do not pass, for transgender people who live in those states to be bombarded by anti-trans rhetoric, hate, and there's always an escalation of violence that goes along with it is absolutely terrifying and devastating. So what we also know is that the conservative right has realized that attacking trans people, along with attacking other communities, is a way for them to stay in power, to win votes and to build their base. So what we also know is that there is going to be a continued escalation of these anti-trans legislative policy, as well as narrative attacks. Um, we're already seeing that now as we get closer and closer to the midterms and that that will have devastating impacts on the lives of trans people all across the country, particularly more vulnerable trans communities, black and brown folks, migrants, and what I'll also say is that, and I'll, and I'll speak more to this with some of the other questions because I don't want to take up um, all the time on these questions, but 
what we've seen is that in the face of this escalation of attacks that trans movements are stronger than we've ever been. We have more organizations than we've ever had. And trans communities have been doing what we all have always done, everything we can to just keep each other alive, to keep each other safe and to fight back against these attacks. And I can speak more to that later. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing. And, and thank you so much for calling out the opportunism and the cruelty uh, for political reasons of the um, of the radical right in the United States and what is happening under a democratic administration as well. It is happening at the state level, as you said, um, but there is, at least it's, it appears to me, very little pushback and very little condemnation, very little coming out uh, from uh, from the federal government, from the federal level, uh, President Biden and, um, um, you know, the federal leadership, you know, Vice President Harris, for instance, um, are not really speaking out against the violence that the transgender community um, across the country, across the world is experiencing and enduring. Um, so thank you for calling that out, Chris, and for shining the spotlight on it so starkly. And uh, Rebecca, um, continuing our uh, conversation, the shift of our conversation on um, the needs to advance uh, the rights and protection of the most vulnerable members of our community. Um, could you speak a little bit more about um, um, how about um, LGBTQI equality and its increasing focus on um, uh, on intersectionality? In other words, using an intersectional lens uh, to advancing and protecting the rights of LGBTQI people. Thanks, and it's really a great question to follow what Chris was saying. Um, I just want to add one more nuance before I go into that. As he rightly said, when the uh, more a friendlier administration comes in, the far right moves to attacks on the state. They also move to attacks in other countries. So we have seen this every single time that when Obama came in, um, when Clinton came in, though, you know, not like he was great on LGBT issues either, but the far right says, we don't have as much work to do here. Let's go practice at the state level. Let's go practice in the global south and let's see what inroads we can make there with our time and money. So the the fight never stops, it just shifts. Um, you know, what we see over and over again is that if you actually want to impact people whose lives are, who, who are more persecuted, whose lives are trickier, who are often ignored or marginalized by the state, the only way to do that uh, in any real way is to be looking at intersectionality. So again, um, going off off of what Chris said, you know, we don't just see trans people being um, demonized right now. We see tr we see migrants being demonized, right? We know that, and that the overlap people who are themselves trans migrants, it isn't just that it's one plus one equals two. It actually by multiple factors means that they are being re rejected from services. Um, one of my colleagues lives in Oklahoma. We're starting to do more work around climate justice in Australia. And she used to run the state level LGBTQ group there. Didn't really think about the climate justice piece when they first started to have tornadoes, which they have never had before. All at once, LGBT people couldn't go to food banks or find shelters because all of those places are run um, are run by Christian evangelical organizations who don't serve, who legally do not serve queer and trans people, right? It's not, it is enshrined in law, they are allowed to reject. And we are seeing some of the most positive and beautiful efforts happening around things like migration where you do have people standing up and saying, no, trans people need different kinds of protections a different kind of space. So at the border, for the first time ever, we have trans migrant housing. That is, there is security, people are safe, and they know they can come in and be themselves. Um, when we, I think what is always tricky is if we're going to make things not just be fleeting victories, right? Not just to win marriage equality and have it rolled back, not to have Title IX protections for trans people and have them rolled back, it actually is important to be changing the narrative and humanizing who people are and making them real. And you really see this in LGBT spaces. We know a big reason that acceptance around LGBT people has increased so much is because most straight cis people 
know an LGB person. We know that doesn't actually translate for the trans community. So a big part of the work in an intersectional way, who are representation? Who are people thinking? Are they just thinking of Caitlyn Jenner, right? They just thinking of white, wealthy trans women, or are they actually seeing the diverse range of who we are and seeing that not as something to be scared of, but instead to say, oh, I can relate. I can be, I can support this community and all of its power and differences. Here, here, um, Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Actually, one question in the chat, uh, which uh, we will be addressing later on, uh, addresses one of the points that you were making, you know, sustainable systemic change. Um, so um, the person who was asking that question, we will get to it a little bit later on in the Q&A. Um, let's now um, use what Rebecca uh, just shared with us, maybe as a jumping off point uh, for talking about where philanthropy comes in, uh, in this space and how philanthropists uh, and philanthropy, uh, philanthropic uh, contributions uh, can help in bringing about uh, this sustainable change, bringing about um, a more inclusive, more intersectional approach to protection and um, advocacy. And um, I would now like to uh, turn um, back to Katie um, and ask her, from a big picture or taking a big picture view, um, how would you describe the current funding landscape uh, for LGBTQIA movements? In a few words, it is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let me just share a few um, pieces of information that might be helpful. And I, again, will invite Rebecca if she, if she wants to, to chime in, because I know that Estrella has done a lot of research in this area as well. Um, but I guess I would just start by saying that our entire movement is severely under-resourced. Um, we see that especially in the global South, but even here in the US, just 28 cents for every $100, 28 cents for every $100 awarded by foundations targets LGBTI groups and issues. And according to our partners at the Global Philanthropy Project in 2019 and 2020, only about, five, it sounds like a big number, but believe me, it's not, about $576 million in philanthropic funding went to queer and transgender causes globally. Less than half was supporting programs outside the United States and Canada. And that is significantly less than 1%, significantly less than 1% of all foundation and government funding, by the way. And we see that particular regions are especially under-resourced, right? So only about $9 million went to the Middle East and North Africa, which is one of the most restrictive regions on the planet. We see that LBQ and trans groups in particular are woefully under-resourced. As Estrella, Mama Cash, and others have researched, only 5% of all of the global funding for queer organizations is specifically directed to LBQ issues and groups, just as one example. Um, but unfortunately, by contrast, more than $6.2 billion over the past decade has flowed to oppose LGBTIQ and women's rights globally, as we've witnessed this rise in the anti-gender movement on a global, regional, you know, national and local level. So, um, and that has, as I put in the chat, has also been well-documented. So we really need progressive funders to step up in a much bigger way. And I would say, um, I can, happy to share now, or perhaps I'll, I'll wait for the, for the Q&A time. Um, I certainly have, some very specific and um, strong recommendations that we have for funders to help address this, this problem and um, bring more investment to our movement. Because we, can, we know that we can, mm. but we have to step up and stop the threats and the, the you know, very real violence that our community is facing and that we have an opportunity to radically accelerate progress, but that is only gonna happen if we have much more investment and many more people joining us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Katie. And again, thank you for providing these really stark numbers, uh, 28 cents for every $100 um, of uh, philanthropic contributions uh, go for or get towards LGBTQIA advocacy um, and $6.2 billion uh, around the world globally are invested in anti-LGBTQIA rights advocacy. So these are really absolutely stark and shocking numbers. If I may turn to Chris now, um, 
looking at the numbers, 28 cents for every $100. Um, when you sit down with an individual philanthropist, somebody you know who's interested in giving, has the funds, has the commitment, how do you describe the impact that they can have to make them open their wallets, to make them write a check, and to increase the contributions that they may have already made? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, and and so I, I would say a couple of things. One, I mean, I think to explain kind of the broader context as we just chatted about. And then I think next is and building off of what Katie said. I mean, the reality is there has been a historic and ongoing lack of investment and resourcing for trans movement in the U.S. and across the globe. And Alongside that, I would say that there has also been by broader movements, whether we're talking about the broader LGBT movement, racial justice movement, also a lack of kind of resourcing support um, and commitment to trans movements. So that overall trans communities entered this time of an escalation of attack um, from a place of having not had support for, for a really long time. Um, and I believe the stat that LGBT funders puts out when they first started collecting this information about how much money goes to trans movements in the US, I believe it was like two cents to every $100. I think maybe it's now gone up to five cents. Um, you know, so it's good that there's some progress, but we're still talking about five cents to every $100. So I think for folks to really understand that in the broader context, uh, there's a real lack of resourcing for trans movements. I think the other thing to name is that there's such incredible and powerful work happening by trans leaders across the country. That that has been true for a really long time and it has been under-resourced for a really long time. And because of some of the ways in which there's been some amount of increase in support, that work has really grown. Um, and just really highlighting that. I mean, particularly we saw this during the, the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was trans people, particularly black and brown trans women in their local communities who were literally on the streets, making sure that trans people had food, knew about what was going on with COVID-19, had access to like preventative supplies and equipment, were like fighting with city governments to make sure that people were got housing and were part of some of the broader efforts. So there's just really incredible, powerful work happening. That's also really visionary. At TLC, we have coordinated a coalition of trans leaders from around the country, the majority of whom are black and brown, the majority of whom are migrants um, living with disabilities to really say like, what is our vision for trans communities? What is our vision of liberation for trans communities? And did that work over a number of years to put together a document called the Trans Agenda for Liberation which is a living document. It's an ever evolving document, which really points and builds on work that has been done, points to work that's happening and points to more work that we need to do. Um, so that there's both like powerful and visionary work that our communities are leading. And that I will say, uh, I, I really believe that trans people are brilliant. And that over time, you know, what we've heard from philanthropy is Trans organizations are too small. We don't know who the trans organizations are. We don't know how to get our boards to support this work. And so over the years, we've really put things in place to support people to give to trans organizations. So like I always point to the Trans Justice Funding Project, who's an amazing organization in and of themselves. They've also done incredible work. You can go to their website and go, they've created a map. You can basically find a trans organization wherever you live that's in deep need of support. There's Grantmakers United for Trans Communities out of LGBT funders who has created tons of resources and also it can individually support people who are trying to figure out how to resource and support trans organizations. And at this point, we also have larger organizations like TLC is one of the larger groups. There's also the National Center for Transgender Equality, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, or large national organizations. So basically, Anyone who wants to support trans groups and communities, there's so many different options and there's so many ways to, to support people to do so. 
thank you so much for sharing this, Chris. And um, if you like to put um, any kind of links in the chat, uh, that would be helpful for the audience, um, you know, to donate to or to make themselves more knowledgeable about uh, or to see, you know, where they can uh, be most helpful and supportive, that would be absolutely fabulous. Um, Katie already uh, dropped in the chat two links to two reports on uh, um, from the Global Philanthropy Project, as well as from Australia. And it would be great if we uh, you know, could have at the end of maybe of our conversation, a list of organizations or reports uh, to share with our audience um, that they could share then with their network so as to uh, elevate and maximize the impact of this conversation that we're having uh, today. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing, Chris. Um, I would now like to uh, turn back to Rebecca actually and ask her to build on what uh, Chris just shared with us. And could you say a little bit more what uh, what do you see as the role of foundations and other institutional founders in the movement? And from a very kind of practical perspective, how can they drive change most effectively? Um, thanks for that. It is a wonderful question. I think there's a couple of spaces. As Sarah Kate said, we're seeing more and more of, of the traditional players in philanthropy pull out of LGBT funding space. We also see a lot of foundations and corporations doing one-time very splashy gifts. They get a lot of good press and that doesn't translate into real change. It doesn't let organizations build and staff up. So my first question to any foundation or corporate giving is, is this part of a long-term plan? If you know anything about movement organizing or change, it takes decades to happen. And foundations really need to be in the long, in for the long haul. And that means not only avoiding one-time gifts, but also making sure that you have a staff member, at least one, who holds this responsibility. With these one-time gifts, it is oftentimes a person on staff who knows how to work the internal mechanisms, makes it happen, they get the money out the door. When they leave, for whatever reason, the money dries up. So really, it's not just the press, it's are you in this with, for the long haul? The second piece that I really think matters is really doing internal audits of what your giving looks like. Are you, who is leading the organizations that you're giving? Are they people of color? Are they queer and trans? And then to really look, are you giving general operating support to white-led, cis-led organizations, but only much smaller project-specific grants to queer and trans organizations? The data, and you know, Katie's putting these great um, reports in the chat box, the data really shows us that there is a double standard in philanthropy for people of color and for trans people, let alone trans people of color. White-led organizations are given much more leeway to make change, to go through difficult times, um, to figure things out. And queer and trans people of color-led organizations are asked to do an immense amount of work in a short amount of time for much less money. So it's not just, are you giving to LGBT? What kind of giving are you doing? Is it long haul giving? And I'll say this, you know, a year ago, I worked at a large private foundation um, and I held our trans and intersex portfolio among others. And between COVID and the racial justice uprising, almost all of those groups went through serious, serious implosions. People were in pain, people were isolated, and they, um, and organizations, as a leader of an organization, I can say this, I'm not a social worker or a therapist. I know how to budget, I know how to do long-term strategic planning, and all at once organizations and organizational leaders were being asked to hold staff's feelings deal with massive amounts of changes while going through isolation and fear themselves. And in those moments, it is philanthropy's job to say, yeah, we're here with you. Like we recognize this is a part of what's happening in the world. We're going to ride out this change with you and we're here for whatever additional support you need. And those moments, you saw some funders who pulled back and you saw some funders who doubled down. And if you're gonna be a, a funder who pulls back, you need to be explicit about that for the beginning so people don't rely on you for the long-term money. 
Thank you so much for sharing this, Rebecca, in particular, the emphasis on thinking long term, thinking strategically, being willing to be in it and be, being in it for the long haul and being a partner and an ally for the long haul and not just looking for quick, shiny uh, change. Um, Sarah Kate, building on what Rebecca just shared with us, um, coalition building um, and finding allies uh, for the long haul are crucial. Um, your organization is known for coalition building and advocacy. Um, now, what role in your experience uh, can donors play in driving policy change long term and sustainably? Um, I think that's that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I, I want to say one another thing is that um, what I think is really interesting, and then I will get to that a thought that I had when Rebecca was, was speaking was, especially um, as we see a lot of the splashy money come in and this corporate money come in, one thing that I've um, been able to successfully do at GLAD for, for a while is um, we hold corporates accountable, especially in Hollywood, um, it, through um, reports that we do. And oftentimes they fail those reports. Um, and um, and social media safety index is another report that we launched about a year ago. And I can tell you that uh, all of them have failed and we've been ruthless um, because what the harm that is doing to our community is horrible. Um, and then on the other side of it, those are organizing tools for our community. Um, and I make them pay us to do that report on top of it. So they pay for me to give them a bad grade. Now, that's not part of the deal. But I think what's really important in all of this, and I'll get to that, is what our value is as a community. And that's where it is so devastating that these numbers are so low, because that means that we are being undervalued. And I um, personally feel that we have to value ourselves and our input and our and our and our work more. And and oftentimes it's very difficult because we're trying to, you know, running, you know, for lack of a better term, mom and pop shops. It's like if we sell bananas today in the deli, then we could make payroll a lot of times in a lot of our organizations. And I've managed organizations at that level. And it's terrifying on a daily basis um, because you're trying to keep your payroll going, support the folks who are vastly underpaid as well already. Um, and so there's a lot of dynamic around here. And I think how philanthropy can step up and should step up is that is is recognizing the value of our community, recognizing the long term commitment that they need to make, like Rebecca was saying, and letting us as leaders do the work that we need to do. And I think Rebecca was saying that as well. Uh, and Chris, is that we understand the movement, we understand where a lot of the the problems are and that don't see the light of day that don't make the headlines um and we need to put efforts on behind that um and so having philanthropy dictate how we spend money or what we prioritize i think is the inverse of how it should be they should come to us and say what are your priori priorities? How can I support those? And can you build coalition around it? So helpful. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, Sarah, for sharing this and, and you know, really advocating this approach of listening, uh, the needs to listen and to need the need for accepting the priorities of the community and not believing that, you know, the, the big funders uh, not necessarily or the big donors necessarily know best. Um, so thank you so much for driving this home. Um, we are about nine minutes away from uh, the conclusion of our conversation. So if it is OK with everybody, I would now like to sneak in the two questions Questions that have come in from the audience and then maybe do a quick wrap up uh, before we conclude. And one question has come in that I would ask Chris to tackle because he really sensitized us 
and really raised awareness of uh, the global backlash from the far right against LGBT rights, uh, the concerted effort, the coordinated effort. And one member of the audience is asking us, how best can philanthropic interest in LGBTQ rights be leveraged towards sustainable systemic change in the context of far right attacks against progress? So this is to say, um, how can we best um, leverage funding to blunt the attacks of the far right? Chris, would you be willing to tackle that question, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the first thing I would say is that, I mean, it's really what everyone has been talking about. Like we need to deeply invest and resource organizations who are really at the forefront of these attacks. So trans-led organizations, national, particularly local organizations who are really on the front lines of fighting back against these attacks and have been for some time. And they know what they're doing. They know how to do it. They just don't have the resources to do it at the scale that we need to fight back against the level and escalation of attack that we're facing. And I, I would also add, and I, because I wanted to say this in the previous question, just forgot, like, I, I also think that, that the reality is that if you care about democracy, if you care about racial justice, if you care about climate justice, if you care about migrant justice and reproductive justice, you need to be investing in trans movements right now. Because the right is using attacking trans communities as a way to roll back rights for everyone, not just trans people. Um, so that's what I would name for that question. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, um, the knowledge and the awareness that um, the attacks uh, that may that are uh, directed towards the transgender communities in the United States are attacks on social justice much more widely and much more uh, complexly. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Katie already put it in the chat. Yes, plus one. I'm I'm adding my plus one to that. Um, from one um, attendee, um, and I'm I'm really directing this to all of you, whoever wants to tackle it. Um, what are steps organizations can take in efforts to center LGBTQ plus donors in their individual giving programs? Anybody want to tackle this? Uh, you know, I think uh, it is both basic things and deeper things. And honestly, look at your forms. Are you assuming that men are married to women and vice versa? What are your pronoun options? And, um, you know, Trans Justice Funding Project, with, which Chris mentioned, is this amazing um, collective way of raising money. And they literally raise every dollar from the community and they give out over half a million dollars a year. Every, and they have donations coming in that are a dollar. So the first thing I would say is like, do an audit of your website and your externally facing materials. What are the, like, as a queer person, I will tell you, I'm always, you know, I see the queer person on every website, right? I'm like looking for it. I see it first. I'm like, oh, that person is. What is your audit? Who are you putting forward as your face? What are you assuming, assuming about family formation? And then um, who are your project serving, right? If I... My partner and I give a lot of money to homelessness issues and to support the homeless. And we're going to do that to, to shelters that are supporting our community too. We're gonna to make sure that even if it's not an LGBT issue, which literally every single issue is an LGBT issue, I'm gonna ask those questions. And if the response is a stumble, a we're not sure, I'm sure we do, it tells me you're not actually paying attention to this community. You just have assumptions that uh, LGBT people are holding more assets, which we actually find to be incorrect for the majority of us. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then Katie's great comment. I would also definitely look at that. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, and she says here, for those of us uh, who are watching, uh, or for those of you who are watching uh, or, or listening on um, on the phone and don't have us all on screen, uh, Katie wrote, um, I would add, have queer people on your staff and board and find your queer donors and get their input help, share and tell their stories as LGBTIQ donors, absolutely. 
And uh, this brings us now uh, close to the end of our conversation. Um, last call for a Q&A from the audience. Um, I think we have answered uh, them all right now. So what I would like to ask our wonderful panelists uh, to do now, and I would like to start with Katie, then uh, turn it over to Rebecca, Chris, and ask Sarah Kate uh, to bring it all together for us. In a sentence or two, what is the biggest takeaway you want us to leave with? Katie. So many things. <laughs> um, I'll just make keep it really brief. Number one, we rise and fall together. Mm. So in order to win and, and not just fleeting victories, as Rebecca said, but to actually achieve our vision, we have to find ways to work together within our community globally and also across movements. Um, Two, we need to look at who's being targeted and under-resourced and prioritize and uplift those members of our community. Three, despite, if you couldn't tell, despite the very real and increasing threats, I am optimistic about social and legal change accelerating and about finding new allies to invest in our global movement. And I think having a sense of being, you know, having your, your lens be based in reality, but having a sense of optimism helps get up in the morning and go, go, go. 110% every day. Um, and then I just wanted to end by inviting people to join outright um, for our annual Out Summit virtual conference, which is happening December 12th to 14th. And I'll put that in the chat. Um, but we bring together over 1,500 queer activists and allies from around the world, um, from over 100 countries, for three days of sessions. And we would love to have you join us. So um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or email. My email's on our website. And I'm always happy to talk with folks about fundraising and how we can get more investment and more allies in our movement. Amazing. Thank you so much, Katie. Solidarity, optimism, and the Outright Summit. Uh, fantastic. Um, Rebecca, what, what are the one or two things that you uh, would uh, like to leave us with? I, um, you know, for a while, those t-shirts, like the future is female, were really popular. And I would say the future is queer and trans, and that's not just a slogan. When you look at numbers of um, people coming out, visibility, what the next generation is thinking about queer and trans people, the levels of acceptance, mm -hmm. a part of the reason the far right is freaking out is because the levels of acceptance are so incredibly high. My niece, uh, 16, came out two years ago. My sister, totally accepting suburban New Jersey, her friends don't care, right? She's she's still the same person she always has been. And we're really just seeing that, not just across the country, but really around the world. So if your organization is not centering queer and trans people, you're losing out on a lot of things, both programmatically, but also financially. Absolutely. Thank you, Rebecca. The future is queer and trans. I like that as a slogan. <laughs> Chris, what would you like, um, what what would you want us to leave with? Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what other folks have said. And, um, and I would say that particularly leaning into that while this is an incredibly challenged and terrifying time for many of us, that I, I do believe there's an incredible opportunity here for us as movements who believe in liberation and justice um, and that we should value everyone, that there's a real opportunity here for us in how we fight back, back against these attacks and how we build towards a different time to, to build different, right? Like we can actually vision a different world, a different way to be in community with each other. And that if we reflect that, even in how we fight back against these attacks, it's gonna mean that we land in a really different place um, when we get on the other side of that, whatever, whatever that looks like. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, incredible word of, of optimism. Um, we are in a position to build a better world, a different world. Um, we just have to get through this right now. Um, these, these years of challenge and Sarah Kate, um, last but not least, uh, what you would, what would you want us to leave with? I will say two quick things. One is philanthropy or as um, fundraisers, go out there and ask for unrestricted gifts and let the people who do the work, who live it every day, 
point those funds. So that's a big one. And then number two is as citizens, I would say these are um, these are troubling times. One thing that we can all do is vote in November. Um, and it is really important, the election that's coming up. Um, it's always important. And these, these are growing more and more important um, each election cycle. So, and we know that when LGBTQ people vote, pro-equality is elected on the ballot. And we have, um, we need to make sure that everybody is voting um, that is, um, you know, pro-equality this coming um, November. So get on that. That's something you can do right out of the gate and get people and family and friends um, out there as well. You're here. Um, absolutely. A change happens at the ballot box, at the state level, at the federal level. Um, please go out and vote. Um, all of all of you, all of us. Um, I, I have a green card. I'm not an American citizen. I can't vote, but I do donate. Um, so uh, please, uh, let's all do whatever we can uh, to help uh, pro equality candidates um, to win the races. It's it. it our lives depend on it. Um, so um, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Um, which brings us now to the end of our conversation. Uh, very rich, very informative, very inspiring, very illuminating, very sobering. Uh, but um, as Chris and, and Katie uh, encouraged us to be, let's, let's remain optimistic. Change is possible. And with the help of uh, philanthropists, with help of uh, donors, uh, change, sustainable systemic change uh, is also happening. Looking to the grassroots, using an intersectional lens, uh, practicing solid Solidarity and allyship uh, will and is making change possible. I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart our wonderful panelists in the order in which they appear on my grid Rebecca Fox, Sarah Kate Ellis, Chris Hayashi, and Katie Haltquist. Um, and I would like to also thank uh, Bianca uh, and Michelle uh, for co hosting uh, this event and for allowing me to moderate it. It was an honor and a pleasure. And uh, Bianca and Michelle, um, if it will be possible, maybe we can collect uh, the wonderful links in the chat and send them out uh, to all participants so they can make use of these wonderful resources alongside um, the recorded Zoom talk. That would be absolutely fabulous. Fabulous. Um, I would like to thank our audience for sticking with us, for sharing their questions and insights and comments with us. Uh, please do stay in touch. Uh, there are many more similar programs coming. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. And thank you again so much, our wonderful panelists and hosts, uh, for this really enriching conversation. And please, everyone, stay safe and well, and hope to see you again soon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>